So Your Eminence, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to have this uh, conversation with you. Um, we're very happy to have you here in Singapore. I understand this is your first time in Singapore? I, I got here yesterday in the morning and uh, I'm already preparing now to return. So right. it's been last night we had a quick drive through town. No, it's, it's great. I mean, something about Singapore we learned already in school. You know, in secondary school, we had to, in geography, we had to learn about entrepôt, mm -hmm. and that's what Singapore is, an entrepôt, right. and what entrepôts are, what they do, and, you know, so this is basically what has transformed Singapore, making it what it is now. And the latest country that has begun to discover the same thing uh, is, uh, is Mauritius, mm -hmm. island also in the Indian Ocean. So it's great for the leadership and the idea that, you know, your former leader had building this, this society up into what it is now. It's right. great. So we we'll congratulate all of you for Thank everything you. that you've been able to achieve and accomplish. Let's talk about you now. We want to know you a little bit more. <laughs> uh, you were born in a, in a mining town in <clears throat> Western Ghana. What was life like, if you can share with us, growing up with nine other siblings? Yes, uh, it is true. My father was a carpenter, so my father was not a miner himself. He was a carpenter in this mining establishment. At that time, it was an establishment of the British company. There are three children before me. Mm -hmm. So I'm the fourth, the second boy, but the fourth child. First and second were girls. So growing up in this, for me, looking back, I find it very exciting for what I did and I was able to do. I mean, I was a big troublemaker. <laughs> when anybody came to the house to complain about one of the sons of Mr. Texan having done something, you know, everybody would look at me. But I was also this big troublemaker that had the idea of becoming a priest. But the exciting thing about it was that growing in a family of 10, you learn to share. That's the only way you live. Sharing to a point that sometime at one point, four boys growing together, if you, you, know, you come and you leave your shirt, next time you come, somebody else is taking it, is going, you leave. So the thing about sharing was what we grew up with. And uh, it was something that you know, became a natural part of life. But it was also a moment which taught us how to appreciate how parents can make sacrifices for the well-being of their children. I mean, you can imagine my father being a carpenter in the mine. The salary wasn't terribly great. You know, it wasn't a terrible great salary. And with that taking care of 10 kids, these days everybody would probably say it's, it's, it's not possible, but they did it. And my mother, she was a trader, trading vegetables in the market. So again, that wasn't a skilled job. In fact, both of them were never in school. Neither my father or my mother was ever in school. So, you know, with such simple means, they still took care of 10 of us. And that makes us just feel a lot of admiration and a lot of sacrifices they must have made you know, to take care of us. Growing up in those days, I didn't have a sense of being poor. I could eat. We had, we had two full square meals a day. Uh, we were clothed, went to school. Uh, we had school fees, everything paid for. We had uniform and every year at Easter and Christmas we could expect a new dress. So there wasn't anything that, of course, you know, my father didn't have a car, uh, you know, we didn't even have a bicycle or anything, but that didn't, that didn't give us, a, you know, any sense or experience of being poor. You know, uh, we had everything that in those days made a child happy. Would you have considered yourself then with all of the basic needs provided for your life as a boy growing up was pretty much carefree in that sense? Carefree, but I mean, the differences were there. I mean, my father as a carpenter, in a mining system, you had the senior staff and the junior staff, okay? So in this case, for example, there was a swimming pool. The senior staff had their swimming pool, the junior staff <laughs> we had our swimming pool. So that was the difference you felt. When the kids like myself going to school, the children of senior staff, they come to school, they drop in a car. I walk to school. So you could still see the haves and do not haves, you know, but that didn't bother me. The thing was that that was the beginning of my sense of having addressed a challenge in life. In life, you don't leave anything the same way you meet it. You always have to be able to 
change something for better. If you can do it, then you make it yourself. So growing up, I made my own toys. Because my father was a carpenter, the tools were there, the saws and the hammer and the, the wood. So I made my sword, I made, I made everything. This is something that I think we miss these days in children growing up. Children get creative, but they cre get creative in another way. They get creative, you know, playing with instruments. We used to get creative doing it. We used to make our own toys. Certainly, I mean, somebody can say, fine, you made them because the toys were not there. If you had toys, you would not have made them. But again, when we were in school, we started school every morning with an exercise of creativity and thinking. So we had something we call mental. Just mental means that you were supposed to think fast. So you lined up and the teacher comes, 12 times 12, you have to come out with the answer. The calculators have come and they're helping children, of course, doing things, but it also made that impact. That exercise of brain, there are differences uh, you know, in life growing up, and I don't regret my childhood. There's nothing that I feel sorry or sad about. It rather fills me with a lot of appreciation for what my parents could do to take 10 of us, all of us, send us to school secondary school, university, and all of us are you know, well placed. In point of fact, development has to occur. We need to go beyond what we meet and improve upon whatever comes our way. So that's the philosophy we live with. With this philosophy that you, you grew up with, I mm. mean, did that lead you very naturally towards the priesthood <laughs> and service for the church? <laughs> The thing about the priesthood was exciting. Yeah, I was not expected to be the one to go to a seminary. Did your other I, brothers consider? One younger one tried to come after me. Then another younger one tried to come. But again, my entering the seminary was a challenge. Here in Singapore, you follow the British system. We had the same thing. You do O level and you do A level and then whatever. And to start the O level, that is you going to secondary school. And to go into secondary school, you need to do an entrance exam. Okay, I did that entrance exam and passed, in fact, two of them. Then, this mining town didn't have a residential priest. It wasn't a parish. It had a church, but no priest resided there. The priest would come visiting every now and then. And so, one Sunday, when the priest wasn't there, I went to the main parish, about six kilometers away, and then on the bulletin board, I saw an advert about people who want to become priests. And I wrote the address in my palm of my hand, and I came home and I wrote to the priest, and the priest came and visited to see who this boy is. I must have been 12 or 13, not terribly old. I was welcome to come to the seminary. My father had a few challenges. He called the whole family and he had me made my decision known to all. And his last words were, well, I don't want you to go halfway and come back. If you want to go, you go all the way. I don't want any disgrace in the family, all of those things. And when I tell the story, people say, wow, you were only 12 or 13. How could you have been committed to that kind of thing? But by hindsight, I say, that's what it is. We all grow with commitment in life. When I meet married people telling me this, that at 12, you were not mature, you didn't know life enough to be able to commit yourself this way. Then I can ask them, but you married your wife. How much did you know about your wife at the time of marriage? So at a certain point, and yet knowing, you know, just something about your wife and not everything, you still decided to commit your life to your wife. And with that, you begin to grow in confidence and trust and everything. I say, that's what it is in the service of God. Something makes you start, and then you grow. You know, when, therefore, I go to any seminary, okay, where all the young children are growing up wanting to be priests, I tell them the story that, like any other thing in life, it's like a car. A car has a starter and the engine. You need the starter to get the engine running. But it's not the starter that runs the car and moves the car. But without the starter, the engine will not start. We all in life need something small, insignificant to get us interested in something, and then we grow. We grow that interest into something that mature. That was the story of my priesthood. Something small happened, being a missionary church, you know, seeing a priest come and go and all of that, and that just, you know, 
got me interested and I decided also to become like that man. But where does vocation start? It starts like a starter. You know, something insignificant and small, but that's what you need to get the engine running. Well, yeah. you've, you've suddenly grown more from uh, just a spark, uh, mm. your eminence, and you are, well, prefect of the dicastery for promoting <laughs> integral human engine. development, right. uh, uh, and handpicked by the Holy Father. And you've also traveled also to many places in the world. You, you've seen yeah. many cultures. Here in Singapore, you see a bustling city, uh, modern, relatively rich. Mm. Uh, we are pretty progressive. But how can the church here best promote and be active now in promoting integral human development uh -huh. in a society which already seems to have everything? That's the point. Seems to have everything is the point. So let me come to your question by referring to another experience. Our office just organized in the, in the Vatican in Rome a small conference on impact investing, social impact investing. It was a conference that brought a lot of investors together. Okay, venture capital investments, philanthropists, a blend, pension fund operators, all kinds of people brought in. Then the, you know, we organized it with the Catholic Relief Services of the United States. And the idea was, you know, impact investing to promote integral human development. From the point of view of our office, this was a, an attempt to find out how social impact investing can make capital available for local bishops or whatever mission, whatever type of thing to grow, okay, or to develop their structures in parishes or whatever. Uh, it was for us an attempt to have local community leaders or church leaders make a transition from dependence on grants and donations to a more business model of, 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 you know, of you know, going for money, okay, which you have to pay back, but you use promoting whatever. Just that as impact investing, the capital or the interest is not as great as you go to a bank. You've come and we've done this seminar or conference about impact investing to promote integral human development. Now, integral human development draws attention to the fact that the human being, being by nature, body and soul, matter and spirit, cannot limit development only to the matter, the body, Development must also take care of the spirit, your transcendent, your soul, religion, culture, and all of those. And so that is the point. The tendency sometimes is to limit development only to one side, the one which you see. On the other side, hardly developed. The human person has a spirit that always yearns to grow, to reach out toward the transcendence. Sometimes that is not taken care of much. So at the end of this, I said, you have come with Impact Investing to help us. But it is time at the end of this to see you as an investor. What is your own level of integral human development? That means you are an investor, so you have the money. But what about culture? What about religion? What about faith? What about this and that and that? So, so you've come to promote integral human development, but how integrally developed are you yourself? So that is a question about what you said about Singapore. Thank God the vision was obtained to develop your strategic position as an entrepreneur. City has been developed very well. It's attracted a lot of business people from outside. But the tendency and the temptation is always there. And Pope Francis talks about this. He says that money should serve the human person. The human person should not serve money. The tendency is that we just go after accumulation and acquisition of wealth, forgetting that you know, we are human beings, we, we, there's a sense of dignity uh, you know, within us, creating the image and likeness of that needs to be nurtured. So that temptation is always there. And in fact, this temptation is there for the rich also as for the poor. The poor person also wanting to get rich sometimes also forgets that there is this other dimension in his life, and it's all world, 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 world. The message of integral human development is not only for the poor, it's also for the rich. 
you want to help the poor live with dignity. But the other component, again, is to recognize that there is this other spiritual character within him, so that must also be developed. And so this is integral human development. Therefore, it's not just affluence. It's not just wealth. It's not just money. Okay? Uh, we need to respect the grammar of our nature. And the grammar of our nature, like any language, without the grammar, you don't speak the language well. If you respect the grammar of our nature, that just means that we are created out of the earth, but God breathed into us the breath of life. And that's why we are human beings. So while we promote the earth, let us also promote the bread that God breathed into us. So you are saying it is not just uh, you know, the, those who, with, who are wealthy and who have money, but even those who are less well off, who can be part of uh, ensuring and promoting integral human development. It's an invitation to all of us, the rich and the poor. Already in the plane coming here, the advert in the plane at a, song, at a certain point has a group of Singapore singing a song. And it has the different components of this society all coming together. And so for the visitor coming to Singapore, he's already introduced to what life in Singapore is. This is the community. There's a concrete policy of government to promote all of this diversity, not to miss any culture in the process, so to enrich the community with diversity. This is unique. Several places do not discover how to enrich a community with diversity. Several places think that it is all integration. And the integration sometimes makes you lose a particular aspect of So here, the encouragement of diversity to enrich the, you know, the culture and the country is a commendable thing. So what you ask me about you know, Singapore, I just want to invite them to be human. To be human, to be true to their human nature. And being true to your human nature is being recognized and recognized what you are as a human being. A true sense of a human, you know, a human person is the ultimate guide to everything that you, know, you do. You bear a dignity that was given you by God. The dignity of the human person is not given by a court of law. It's not given by the United Nations. It's given by the fact that you were created in the image and likeness of God. That is the source of your dignity. And if this is the source of your dignity, promoting dignity, which is the ultimate sense of development, means therefore that we discover who we are and we promote every aspect of this. God said this years ago. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, this was when God was bringing Israel into the promised land. God gave them a warning. The land in which you are to enter, you get a lot of gold. You get a lot of oil, iron, whatever. You get all the treasures from the rocks. And you will grow and the abundance will come. But be careful that these abundance do not lead you to forget the Lord your God. That is the basic thing of all humanity. The gifts that God bestows on us can sometimes lead us to forget the Lord who has given us these gifts. I can say this to Ghana. I can say this to any poor, but I can say it also to Singapore, United States, wherever we go. Because the human being is one, essentially the same. And that with the dignity that comes from God, ours is to protect this dignity and make it develop in every aspect of our lives. Materially, economically, politically, socially, religiously, transcendental, all aspects must be developed. And that's the business of our office, promoting integral human development. What is your personal prayer? the church and the people of God today? I think the basic, the, the basic prayer, which I myself would probably pray every day, so I start my day always invoking the Holy Spirit. So I, I start the day invoking the teacher. So the, I, the need for teacher, so the need for guidance in the new day that I'm about to start. It just means that I recognize that I can, I can run into any condition, whatever type of the new, old, prepared, unprepared, and all of that. And there's the need always to seek to be pleasing to God. It's facilitated for us by the gift of the Holy Spirit, which has been promised to us. So that's why I will start my day always, you know, with an invocation of the Holy Spirit, which just means that my prayer is always that all of us seek to be pleasing to God at every moment of our lives. We don't desire anything more to seek to be pleasing to God in whatever state, in whatever situation we have. 
you know, part of our work is also to help people to do this. So we did a small booklet for businessmen. And it was an attempt to help businessmen bring their faith into their business and not to live separate lives. You can bring the two together. You are not a schizoid. You are, you know, just one person and your faith must come. How you believe must direct how you, you know, you do things. So we did a small booklet called The Vocation of the Business Leader. And that was an attempt to help business people, you know, live such a coherent life. And at the end of that booklet, we offer something that can be called the examination of conscience. At the end of the day, the business person can, so how did I do today? Okay, and how did I do today inspires how he will pray the following morning as he steps up. So my prayer essentially is that. I pray that we all seek to be pleasing to God in everything that we do. Thank you, Your Eminence. But as so as we end this uh, interview, could you lead us in prayer and impart upon us your, <laughs> your blessing, please? Today is Sunday, where do we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, so his victory over sin and death and everything that besets our human nature and a new resurrection grace that enables us to excel. So Heavenly Father, we just want to pray this morning for where we gathered and doing this interview. So for the land of Singapore, for its country, for its president, for its leaders, politicians and all. Today you gave us the message of Good Shepherd. May these leaders become Good Shepherds for the people of this land. And in that note, we pray, Lord, for the same grace and gift of being good shepherds to countries all over the world. So very many are the disturbances of countries on account of governance. And for this, we commend all countries, Lord, Lord, into your hand. Provide them, Lord, with good shepherds. People who, with the spirit of uh, you know, servant leadership, will seek the well-being of the people, their common good, and not just any exercise of power in itself. We pray, Lord, for this great gift of good shepherds to, be, to, to take charge of your people wherever they are, to seek and to be free with the well-being of people all around the world. We pray for this grace of good shepherds for your own church, for the leadership of Pope Francis, for that of bishops and pastors and even catechists all around the world, Lord. May they be good shepherds for the communities entrusted to their care. And so do we pray, Lord, for this same grace and gift of Good Shepherd to our families. May fathers and parents become Good Shepherds in their homes and their families to their children and all on whom people's lives depend. And I want to pray, Lord, for the same gift of being Good Shepherds to also the very many positions of power in society. May they all be exercised as the grace of being Good Shepherds and at the end, we ask you, Lord, to raise your hand over us here in Singapore, over our world. Bless us and grant us the gift of peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.